truth, and because there's no truth, there's no what? There's no mercy. And now we have people killing each other in the streets of Chicago, celebrating doing a parade. And man, I felt sorry for this dude. I was watching, I just saw a video just the other day where this guy's just gassing up his car in some inner city place somewhere, and he's got, he's got this gold chain, and three guys jump him, and they're beating him up just for his chain. So there's no mercy. And here's why. And there's no what? This is the issue. There's no knowledge of God in the land. So this guy that shows up first time, Hosea, he's the first of 12 minor prophets. What's God laying out? The fact that there's no knowledge of God where? In the land. That's our issue. That's what's wrong with America. We have no concept of God anymore, of who he is. Everything has become subjective. Why? Because there's no truth. Look at the next couple verses. This gets really weird. There's no knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out. And here's what happens. And blood toucheth blood. Another term, another word for that is what do we call it? It's violence. We've become an extremely violent culture. I'm always amazed, and I remember when I was heading out to Cuba a year ago, January, um, I had people calling me, my relatives, my siblings, you're going there by yourself, you better not go by yourself. Man, Cuba is one of the most safest places on the planet. There was nothing to fear. I would be more concerned walking some of the streets in our cities than I would walking downtown Havana. And we wonder why we're where we're at as a people. That's why these guys show up. That's why these prophets, these 12 dudes show up. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and then Malachi. Remember these guys? Can you advance me one, Jay? Here's our chart. Here's who they are. And you guys are very familiar with this chart. It shows up into three areas, right? Three distinct periods of time. Before they were led into captivity, why did they end up in Babylonian captivity they had gone so wayward things had gotten so bad the civil war was so crazy and so bizarre that God says you're right I'm going to start sending some Gentile kingdoms to deal with you because you can't even fix your own issues your own problems then the Assyrians show up they take over the 10 northern tribes and a mere 120 years later the Babylonians show up and they take Judah and Benjamin captive and this is where Daniel and, and Ezekiel show up and write their prophecies as they're held captive or in captivity in Babylon. And then as we saw 70 years later in 536 BC, the last three guys show up. These we know as the post-exile prophets. The prophets that show up in the life of the nation of Israel, right? Even after God says, all right, you can go back now. And uh, let's get back on track. And from two weeks ago when we were starting, we were studying this other guy, Haggai, the first of the post-exile prophets. What was his theme? What was his hope? What was his prayer? What was his desire to do what? Go ahead, Marie. Go ahead, Michelle. Somebody. To rebuild the temple. The temple that had been destroyed 70 years prior by the Babylonians. And he had to beg the people for five years to get their priorities right. Let's rebuild God's building so that we can worship again. And for five stinking years, they chose not to. Why? Because just like you and me, we were focusing on our stuff. Remember verse number five? Five times you find the phrase, consider your ways in the book of Haggai. And I shared with you how the next prophet, this is where we're at tonight, Zechariah, he's a contemporary of Haggai. They show up at the same time. Haggai is looking at things that are playing out in a current setting. In other words, let's get this building built. And I shared with you how, again, if you look at your principles of Bible study, the principle number four is the three applications of Scripture, right? The Bible has three applications. It's history, it's history. It's doctrine or prophecy. It's also practical, the inspirational application. 
Remember that? You know what God is revealing to us out of places like the book of Haggai? That we ought to focus on getting God's temple built. Where's God's temple today? You, exactly. We are God's building. You are his temple. So how do we, how do we focus on God's temple practically in the New Testament? How do, what do, how, how do we build it up? You nailed it. That's how we do it. Discipling. Right? Why do we disciple, right? Paul was very clear in Ephesians chapter 4, verse numbers 11 and 12. He says there's, the church should be about having uh, evangelists and pastors, teachers, and prophets. For what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints. That doesn't mean to make you sinless. That means to mature us. Mature the believer for what purpose? For the work of the ministry. And it's so cool because so many of you or so many folks that have been in our church recently stepped up recently and said, you know what, I want to be discipled. So why do we disciple, right? Why are we doing it? So we can see you mature so that you could become that mature believer so that you could invest your life in somebody else. And then what does that do, the third point in verse number 12? Perfecting the saints, the work of the ministry, for what purpose? The edification of the body of Christ. Now God is edified as he, as we're built up together. And you know what's really cool? As a church now, we get it. And we realize that our mission, that sign over the door, is all about you walking out those doors to see the lost saved and the saved discipled. That's what we're called to do. That's how we can change this world. It's never too late. How do we know that? Because some of these prophets... Some of these prophets show up and God takes them to these crazy, bizarre places where they're able to transform the world. I've got some ideas about where things are really are. We'll probably share those in uh, September, August and September. I'm going to be sharing with you what we're going to be studying on Wednesday nights in a couple of weeks, um, which I think you're really going to enjoy just to kind of continue to bring some perspective. But... Please, don't forget why we're here. We're here so that we could bring glory to God as he uses us in transforming lives. Lost, saved, and the saved, discipled. So, getting back to Zechariah, this guy shows up. He shows up with his buddy Haggai in the Bible. If you're not mindful or we remember this from last week I shared with you a verse out of the book of Ezra chapter 5 verse 1 specifically where these two guys are mentioned together and if you know anything about the book of Ezra the book of Ezra is a historical book in your Bible that reveals to us how and when the children of Israel return back to the land and if you remember from our study last week I shared with you that the initial group the initial phase of the remnant that returned in 536 BC under the leadership of Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, who was the governor, and these two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. Um, The main group that showed up were those folks that were hoping and wanting and desiring to do what? To see the temple rebuilt. In other words, these were the God-fearing folks. There were a whole bunch of more that stayed behind in Babylon. Why? Because they had it good. They were enjoying their, their time together, hanging out in Babylon, experiencing everything that Babylon had to offer. And these guys show up with the sole purpose of re-embracing or embracing who they are or who they were. And even in that sense, they failed in not really stepping up and getting that temple built again right away. Kind of like us. So easy to get distracted, huh? So easy to lose focus. And um, again, I'm encouraged by you guys, by the fact that you've stepped up. Then there's a whole group of you, some of you in this room that have just finished discipleship. We're going to train you up to be mentors, to be disciples in somebody else's life. So we'll be announcing that class pretty soon on how to disciple. So um, I'm just excited. I'm psyched for what God's doing in so many of your lives and so many of our lives in this 
in this room together. So these guys show up, Haggai and Zechariah here in Ezra chapter 5, verse number 1. Thanks for bringing that up. Jay, you could go back to that slide you just had up. Uh, again, I want to remind you that um, uh, what his name means, we've gone through and we've listed these guys' names by name. Um, what's really cool about our Bible, um, which is different than what a Jewish person would read, uh, if, I, if, this, if, if, we were, if this Bible were a Bible that I picked up from a local synagogue, um, it, would, it wouldn't have 12 minor prophets. It would all be lumped together in one book. Well, in our Bible, these are 12 separate guys. And not only that, they're laid out differently than you would see in a Jewish Bible, implying that God has clearly laid out an order of these prophets that reveal so much to us about his plan and his purpose for our lives. Can you back, back up a couple slides, Jay? For example, look at the first guy. Hosea. What does Hosea's name mean? The Lord saves. Your journey and my journey called Christianity can never begin without first knowing and realizing that he's your savior. And then look at the next guy, Joel. This is always a challenge, and we talked about this on Sunday a little bit. Remember the book, the letter to the Ephesians? A lot of Christians are good about making Jesus their Savior, but where we fail is in making him Lord. And you know what Joel's name means? The Lord is God. That he's your Lord. And if he's your Lord, you're, take, you're, you're prepared and you're ready and you're willing to take that step to do what? Everything that we just closed the book of Joshua about, and that is to serve him. That we're here to serve the Lord. And how do we serve the Lord? By serving one another. By discipling. By seeing people saved. It's simple, isn't it? It really is. The mission is simple. Christianity is simple. But you know what it is? It's hard to live. Because God has a, an expectation of each and every one of us. Look at the next guy's name. Amos. To bear a load or a burden. You know what happens when you start to disciple somebody? Right? Some of you have already experienced that. You're going to start bearing a load and a burden. But you know what's so cool? As you help that person through their issues and their problems, and you start to see transformation in their lives, man, what a blessing. And then one of these days, that person becomes a mentor, a disciple, and somebody else. That's God's desire, God's plan. Where you get to that place, where I get to that place in my life, where we realize that it ain't about me anymore. But it's about His glory. And that's, isn't this a cool order? That's not how they show up, even chronologically. You guys already saw chronologically out there. Back up two slides, Jay. This is how they show up chronologically. One more. This is where they show up chronologically. This is how the Jews read them. This is how it shows up in their Bible. Chronologically. Ours aren't chronological. Isn't that cool? Why? Because God, God's got a message he's, that he's preaching to us in the order in which they show up in our Bible. Can you go back two, sli two forward, two slides? So now we're at Jonah. No, go, go back one, thanks. Um, she's tracking good. Look at uh, Obadiah's name. When you start to bear that burden, now you're going to embrace the fact that you're ready and willing to become what? A servant of God. Next one, Jay. Then Jonah, his name means dove. Now the Holy Spirit is the one that's driving your life and not you anymore. Which leads to, now you're becoming Christ-like. Who is like the Lord, Micah. And now you're finding comfort and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ in every aspect of your life as you start to experience and see and witness all this chaos and absurdity in the world, you're going to be like this because you know who you are in Jesus. Nahum. And then this guy, this guy's one of my favorite dudes, Habakkuk, and I love the message in his prophecy. Now you're embracing God's vision and God's purpose for your life. Which leads us to the last four. And this is where we're at. Which leads us to the last four. Which leads us to the last four. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Zephaniah. Is this a cool one? Isn't this a cool one? Now you know you're his. You're his special hidden little treasure, man. And you're 
and you're, you, you, you're finding refuge in him. Not this world, not in me, not in the church, but you're finding refuge in Jesus. And then you get to Haggai, whose name means festive, and we talked about this whole thing, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to look to Ed Phillips. Ed Phillips, what is the most important feast in the Jewish culture? The most significant. They're all important. Which is the one that they look for more than anything else? The what? Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to talk about where the tab- Feast of Tabernacles shows up. They're all waiting for that, man. We're going to talk about the Feast of Tabernacles tonight in Zechariah. That's the one period. And look what his name means. Festive. And uh, now we're looking at Zechariah, and his name means the Lord remembers. That's why we're titling this study, The Lord Remember the Future. That's kind of a little oxymoron or a paradox, isn't it? And then we're going to close next week with an incredible theme, Malachi, because my hope and my prayer is we move into the fall and then especially into next year that we all become his messengers. We're going to spend a lot of time and energy and effort and pray and ask God to lead us into 2022 focusing on the lost. Let's really go outside these doors. You guys are awesome at discipling. You guys are, you know the word of God and I'm so excited, but you know what? There are people, there are relatives, there are loved ones that we have that we know that if they were to die today, they would not be experiencing what God has promised you and I. So, all right. So this Zachariah guy, really an interesting dude. Um, This is what... Um, some of the things that we highlighted last week that I want you to consider again. His name means the Lord remembers. A key phrase that I uh, shared with you is found in Zechariah 117. I love this verse. Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will what? Turn unto you. What a great principle that is for the believer. This is a take-home verse. This is why we refer to this as a key phrase or a key thought in, this, in the text or in the entire book. 14 chapters and they divide really nicely in half the, the first eight we, we were focusing on last week. He's giving these visions of the future prophetically. And if you track and if you go back to our study last week, you're going to see every one of those ten visions that we covered last week are revealed to you in the book of Revelation in some form. So go back and I would encourage you if you want to go back because we're not going to look and we're not going to review those first eight chapters from last week. And then the key thought is not by might nor by power, but by his spirit are we able to overcome. And uh, no government, no military could ever replace the power of God and how he works in our lives. And we're going to see that tonight as we consider the second coming. Um, The theme of the Bible is about a battle for a kingdom and a throne and his kingdom finally gets established um, in what we're going to look at and consider tonight. He comes back. So the culmination of all the Bible is revealed to us. Again, Zechariah, the last, the, last, uh, the last six chapters from chapter number nine to chapter number 14 focus on those two major events in particular. His return, the coming... And his kingdom. And his kingdom is going to last how many years? I know you guys already noticed. How many years? A thousand years. There's a term that we use in Christianity, although it's not a biblical term. What is it called? Give me another term for the thousand year reign. Or the kingdom. The what? Good job. The millennium. Which simply means what? Mil anum, which simply means a thousand years. Jesus on planet earth for a thousand years. Chapter 14. Tish, you have a question. Probably. Thank you for finding my typo. Oh, that was last week's typo too? Hey, you're supposed to edit these. <laughs> I'm whether looking at Jay. Should I look at Jay or Larry? You're right, you're right. It's it's Zachariah 1 3, not 117. 117 is the last verse, the key verse. Um, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose and here's the key city 
You know how many times the word Jerusalem shows up in the book of Zechariah? 24 times. That's how key that city is in God's plan and God's purpose. So Jerusalem is, in fact, in chapter 12, it shows up some 12 times. Chapter 12, look at your principles of Bible study, the Bible numerology, right? The number 12 is the number of what? What's the number of the number 12 represent? No? Number 12, I know you guys know. Larry, what's number 12? Oh, you don't need your book. You should know that off the top of your head, lady. There you go, it's Israel. It always represents Israel. Don't forget, how many tribes are there? Twelve. When did the promise happen in Genesis chapter? Genesis chapter 12. When were they liberated from Egypt? Genesis chapter 12. Isn't that cool, these patterns? When did Israel reject? Where he changed the game? Matthew chapter 12. So again, man, these incredible patterns in Scripture. This amazing consistency throughout the Word of God. 12, 12, 12 is always Israel. There's how many disciples? How many gates? And the, how many gates? And what, how many judges in Matthew 19? 12. That's because that's going to be 12 apostles that are going to be judging the 12 tribes during the millennium. So even they've got a role. Guess what? Peter, James, John... All those dudes, they show up again. How about Iscariot? How about Judas Iscariot? What happened to him? He got replaced by who? Close. By who? Acts chapter 1. Matthias, right? He replaces Matthias. Why did they have to replace him? Because there needs to be 12 dudes in the millennium. That's why. God's got a plan. You, you, guess what? You, Ebony, you get to meet Peter. In a few years, after the second coming, after Jesus sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem, his throne in Jerusalem, those dudes are going to show up again. I can't wait to meet John. Hey, Tokayo! <laughs> That's what I'm going to say to him. So, very cool. God's good, man. He's got a plan. He's got a plan for our lives. He's got a purpose for you, and he's revealing it to us in his word. So, again, these guys are really, really key guys in how um, we do that. I shared with you last week, this guy, Zechariah, he holds a unique place, unlike the other 11 minor prophets. If you remember, obviously, he's one of the prophets, right? He's one of the prophets. He's one of the 12 minor prophets, and one of the prophets generally, including the major ones, but what other hat does he wear, which is different from all the other guys from last week? He's also what? No? Did you say priest? Oh, I'm so sorry, Mary. I thought you said grace. He was also a priest. He's also a priest. So he holds the hat of both a prophet and a priest, a unique role completely different than all the other guys. So this is why, so when you're studying the New Testament, right? So if you think about what God did with Israel, after that last dude that we're going to study next week, Malachi, because Israel continued to reject their message, Malachi means God's messenger, after they reject that message once and for all, God's going to shut his prophecies down. So for 400 years, there isn't a peep from God. No absolute word from God. Till who shows up? John the Baptist. Till John the Baptist shows up in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. You want to hear an interesting thing about John the Baptist? He too held the same two hats as Zechariah. That of a priest, I'm sorry, that of a prophet, right? He's likened to Elijah and also to a priest. He was from the tribe of Levi. You know why he hung out in the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey? Because he refused to be a part of all the nonsense that was going on in Jerusalem. So when Jesus shows up in the life of John, there was no prophets going on. John the Baptist is the first guy to show up prophesying, Behold the Lamb of God who what? Who taketh away the sins of the world. 
So he's prophesying and he's also in the role of a priest. And when Jesus shows up and these Jewish leaders, religious leaders that he butted heads with constantly, who was in charge? Who turned him over to Pilate to be crucified? Who? I know you know. Caiaphas, the high priest. The high priest. So now you're able to connect dots as to why things played out the way they played out in the Gospels with Jesus. Because God said, I'm done sending you my messengers. The one, the, they, they do send a messenger. God does send him a messenger. What do they do to him? They beheaded him. Who beheaded him? Yeah, who turned him over? The Jewish religious leadership. So we're going to talk about some of these little things, these key events that help us understand why things happen and why these things play out in the New Testament. I shared with you uh, last time, um, this is our outline uh, for the entire book of Zechariah. We talked about the visions of the prophet last week. We didn't really talk about chapter 7 and 8 much, but again, you saw the same old game play, being played out by God's people, the leadership actually, and this is why those two chapters are referred to as the vanities of the people. Uh, they, they come in from Bethel, which is up north, and they're trying to impose their religious agenda on what God was doing with Zechariah in Jerusalem. Again, don't forget Haggai and Zechariah are prophesying from Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a key city when it comes to the second coming of Christ. Very significant, very key. So, this is where we found ourselves. We looked at the ten visions last week, and if you're not sure what they are, um, uh, you can get online and look at what we covered last week. Um, so tonight, we're going to look at the last point, or the last principle, the visitations of the prince. The visitation of the prince. And again, I'm trying to use all these alliterations so things match up, so you guys know who I'm talking about, right? Who are we talking about? Who's the prince? The prince of peace. It's Jesus. Probably no other book or minor prophet lays out the second coming like Zechariah. He's very explicit in some of the things that happen or play out. Not just the second coming, but, Je but Jesus is coming, as you'll see here tonight as to why I'm referring it to Jesus is coming. So uh, this is where we're at. Uh, t take your Bibles real quick. I just want to share with you a thought as we start diving into this whole concept of, uh, of Jesus is coming. Um, and never forget these two verses that we're going to cover. Turn, take your Bibles and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, we, we briefly mentioned these two verses last week, but it's verses 6 and 7, um, because I want you to never lose sight of this truth when you're studying the Bible, when you're getting into the Bible and you're considering how and why these guys show up, when they show up, and how things play out in the history of Israel, because ultimately it affects us. And again, this is a verse or a cut two verses that we're all familiar with because they show up every, what? At every, every year at Christmas time on your Christmas cards. So look at verse number, um, number uh, six of Isaiah 9. And again, track with me because this is really important. Two verses that we're going to look at and then we're going to kind of unpack them briefly because you're going to see the same kind of scenario play out in the book of Zach Zechariah, but to a lot more detail. Look at verse 6. It says this, For unto us a child is born, Isaiah says, and unto us a son is given. And that, in those two phrases right there, you see the Spirit of God in His Word through Isaiah mentioning the fact that the Messiah is going to be born a child. Right? Well, when the Messiah shows up at the second coming, he ain't coming as a child. So had these religious dudes in Jesus' time, had they been sensitive to God's word, they would have known that the Messiah would have been born as a child. As a matter of fact, in Micah, if you remember that from that study, Micah chapter 5 verse 5, Micah reveals to Israel exactly where he was going to be born, Bethlehem. 
And they still missed the boat. They still rejected him. Because look at the rest of the two verses here. Look at the rest of these thoughts that play out. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, Isaiah says. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. So right there, the Bible tells you who the Messiah is. Not just was he some deliverer of the nation of Israel, but he's God in the flesh. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and he's also referred to as the, what? The Prince of Peace. Who's Isaiah writing about? Jesus Christ. Look at the rest of the passage. Look at verse 7. And of the increase of his government and the peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon whose kingdom? His kingdom. See the issue? Don't forget. Never forget the fact that the theme of the Bible, the theme of this book is a battle for a kingdom and a throne. Start with that premise whenever you're studying the Bible. And everything will make sense as you begin to read and study the, these passages. And look at the rest of the verse. And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even for how long? Forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now here's the point, and I made this last week, and I'm going to echo it again this week. And you guys, some of you have been here a while. You're, you're familiar with this passage. Show me in history where the last part of verse 6 and 7 happened. Has it happened? That's right. The only event that has happened historically was the first, was the first part, that a child was born. We know that is the what? The first coming of Christ. The first advent. But you know what, the, you know what God's purpose is and always has been? To establish his kingdom. Okay, check this out. On this planet. In a particular city. That's always been his goal. So, you know what we're going to read tonight? We're going to read the details on how God sees these two verses come to fruition. On how that's all going to play out. So in your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Zechariah now. As we start to maybe unpack some of these uh, thoughts or some of these verses in our text. And we're going to talk and you're going to see in the Bible, we're going to jump around from verses 9 to 13 and ultimately 14. Just kind of jump around. So hang with me because, again, what these prophets see and what they didn't see. And again, if Jay, Dre, if you don't mind, could you take me to the dispensation chart? Because again, I want to, I want to make sure that everybody understands how this timeline works. This is principle number three of Bible study, right? You know that. The importance of time. And this chart and this timeline is really key in understanding how the Bible is broke down. Because what we just read in the book of Isaiah, what we just read in the book of Isaiah, chapters 9, verses 6 and 7, and what we're going to unpack today in the book of Zechariah, is this event, is this event right here, and this event right here. You know what's, you know what doesn't show up? In those verses, or in the verses that we're going to consider tonight, this period right here, and this event right here. What's this event called, Tim? The rapture of the church. Who's living here? So here's the point, and I think we touched on it last week. Isaiah and Zechariah, they don't see this. Why? Because the church is a what? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 32. The church is a mystery. So the Jews don't see the church age. The Jews don't see what God is doing in his plan. You know what they see? The coming of the Messiah. So you know what Isaiah saw? A child being born. You know what Zachariah sees? Not only a child being born, not only him, but, but the, the crucifixion shows up in chapter 12 and verse number 10. They saw the, uh, Zachariah saw the piercings of his hands and his feet. But he doesn't see the church. Why doesn't he see the church? Because God had you in mind for the church. How did the Jews, how did the Jews don't even realize that these last 2,000 years have even occurred? Michelle, did you have a question? Did I see your hand? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. 
wait, hold on. Marvin wants to capture your your uh, record your voice. So during the church age, um, Jesus Christ sent us the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Right. Now that we're studying the millennium, what is going to be the responsibility or the how is the Holy Spirit? Great question. And I've been thinking about that. Yeah, and I've that's been good. wanting to ask you. I want to know. Yeah. That that's a that's a really good question. The Holy Spirit has always been present. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God, right? It's the third person of the Trinity. First John five seven. There are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Holy Spirit's always been present. It was the Holy Spirit that created the universe as well. And the Spirit moved upon the waters, and right, and He separated the waters from the waters. So who's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's God. How God worked in the Old Testament was how outwardly, outwardly. Isaiah chapter eleven is your answer to that question. There's seven different modes, if you will, for lack of a better term, that God used in how the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament. So now, as we move into the tribulation period, and then ultimately into the millennium, which is a Jewish kingdom, guess how he's going to work? Outwardly again, not indwelling. He's going to work outwardly. Exactly like he did in the Old Testament. And Isaiah reveals to you exactly how he functions or functioned in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter number 11, I think it's verse 11, is your text. It's known as, and they show up in the book of Revelation, the seven spirits of what? Of God. The Holy Spirit will not be... Indwelling, no. Indwelling during no. the tribulation. Right. You see that even in the early part of the book of Acts. Let me give you an example, right? Because we've already discussed this kind of in passing and briefly. Um, because even in at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit of God uh, empowered... Um, let, let's back up a little bit. To, because this is a good thought. This is a good, good passage. And um, yeah, we'll get through it. Watch this. Go to John chapter 10 first. No, John chapter 20. So this, is, this chapter that we're going to look at real quick in uh, the Bible, um, in John chapter 20, is immediately after the resurrection. And if you remember from chapters 14, 15, and 16, especially in chapter number 14, it's in that chapter where Jesus at the Last Supper, as he's gathering the disciples together, all 11 of them except Judas Iscariot, he says, I'm promising you something really significant and profound, and it's my spirit. He refers to him as his comforter, right? And he says, you want to hear something really crazy, guys? He's going to indwell you. He's going to be inside of you. So the issue that begs the question, when did that, for lack of a better word, and I'm going to sound creepy or weird here, but when did that possession occur? When did the Holy Spirit indwell the, the disciples? Look at John 20. He empowered them there. Check this out. So in John chapter 20, um, this is um, the passage that reveals to us and the issue and the challenge that um, Thomas in particular was having about was having about the whole resurrection of Christ, the story of doubting Thomas, right? We're familiar with that passage. Look at this. Um, verse number 19, And the same day at evening, this, is, this would have been the first day of the week at the resurrection, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, I love the Lord. Look at his first words out of his mouth after he reconnects with them. Peace be with you. He's always about bringing peace to our hearts, huh? Look at the next verse. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the... Look at this phrase, or this term. When they saw what? The Lord. We don't have a chance to unpack this, but keep this thought in mind. Whenever you see the word Lord in the Bible, 
it's a reference to the triune God. And I'll share that with you at some point. How Lord is a reference to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they're already acknowledging that Jesus is the triune God. Watch this. Look at the next verse. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he did what? He breathed on them. And saith unto them to do what? Receive the what? Is that what it says? Receive what? The Holy Ghost. Here's why the terms matter. Holy Spirit versus Holy Ghost. Any time, again, look at principle number one of Bible study. Is what? Context. Right? Principle one of Bible study is always context. And then the terms and the phrases and the words of the Bible help determine and help define context. There's a reason why the Spirit of God chooses to use the word Holy Ghost versus Holy Spirit in certain contexts. Because whenever you find the term or the word Holy Ghost, it's, the context is always going to be, or there's exceptions to every rule, the context will always be the indwelling aspect of the, the Spirit of God in your life. When it's the Holy Spirit, like Paul says, to walk in the Spirit, it's always going to be an outward perspective. In other words, how the Spirit of God works in your life. That you are to manifest outwardly the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on. So, look what happens when you breathe on them. They receive what? They receive the Spirit of God. You know what's crazy about these, these guys? Kind of like you and me, remember the day that you got saved? You didn't really have any clue that at that instant the Spirit of God indwelled you. Right, because we just have, there's just some things we don't have figured out. You know when God really makes it known to them, really reveals to them, 50 days later at Pentecost. And he tells them though in Acts chapter 1, if you remember that part of the story, he says, I don't want you guys to go anywhere. You stay in Jerusalem because I'm going to do some crazy town stuff. And you know what it was? The Holy Spirit empowered them at Pentecost. But they were still asking, the question was still being asked by the disciples, how do we get saved? Not how do I get saved, but how do we get saved? Why? Because he was still dealing with Israel as a nation, as a people, as a we. Because you go some 14 chapters later when a Philippian jailer comes to Christ. You know what his question was? How do I get saved? Do you see the difference? Now you see the transition where God's not dealing with the nation anymore. So when he's dealing with the nation, when he's dealing with Israel, especially in the tribulation period, if you look at that timeline and in the millennium, it's outward. It's outward. But don't lose sight of the fact that those 12 guys that were empowered by the Spirit of God in Acts chapter number 2 were the first Christians, were the first believers. They had already received. So God already had a unique plan and purpose for their lives. And then from, put the timeline back up, back up Jay. So from Acts chapter number 2, actually John chapter number 20, Jesus makes the prophecies in 14. Throughout the church age, throughout this entire period right here, you know how people come to God? By receiving Him as their what? Personal Savior. And the first thing that happens when you receive Him as your personal Savior is what happens? The Spirit of God indwells you. That's what's crazy. Now, now you have the power to overcome. Now you have the power. Did, I, am I answering your question or no? So he, when the rapture happens, guess who's leaving with him? The indwelling Holy Spirit. So now, the tribulation kicks in. And you'll see it in Revelation. Exactly what Isaiah said. About how the Spirit of God is going to deal with this world. Outwardly. He's still present. God's not going anywhere. He's still going to be involved. Cause why? Because he's sovereign. Does that make sense? Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. So, this is a unique period, man. 
So from the book of Acts, chapter number 2, if you want to start there, but especially chapter number 8, where the Ethiopian eunuch comes to Christ, until the rapture of the church, this whole thing, man, is a mystery to anybody and everybody, especially those Old Testament Jews, like Isaiah, like Zechariah. So now Zechariah shows up. Look in your Bibles. Look in the book of Zechariah. And now you start to see references to the Messiah's return or to the coming of the Messiah, if you will. So in verses 1 through 7, for example, you see Isaiah mentioning the fact that the Messiah came to be a shepherd, to feed the flock. We know that and we see that in the New Testament, right? Remember the Gospel of John chapter 10? Where Jesus refers to himself as what? The good what? The good shepherd. He says, I have come to give you life and a life more abundantly, but there's a thief that comes to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Why does he refer to the adversary, to the devil as a thief within the context of being a good shepherd? Because that's what the adversary does. You know what he's doing in the world like never before? He's, when he, we talk about stealing, killing, and destroying, you know what he does more than anything right now? He steals people's identity. He steals a believer's identity. He robs them of who they are. One of the things, man, that I do when I'm discipling, when somebody's going through a challenge or an issue in their life, is reminding them of who they are in Christ. Don't forget ever, I tell my disciple, don't forget that you are his child, that you're his and we just have to come to a place, man, where we become that sheep that hears his voice. This is why he says to you and to me that my sheep will do what? They hear my voice. One of the coolest things that we ever saw in Israel, and we didn't even know this at the time, but if you remember that little experience where we got off the bus off the side road and Jim Martin, our tour guide, ushered us onto this, the side of this hill and... Um, we're just kind of sitting there and he opens up the gospel of John chapter 10 and he's reading the passage of the good shepherd and all of a sudden in the distance he knew exactly what time this, this happens we could hear and we could see the shepherd ushering his sheep into this field and what was cool is they were following his voice wherever the shepherd would go they would follow him and behind the group of sheep, there was another dude that was there to assist the shepherd. The shepherd is there because he loves his sheep. Those are his sheep. They hear his voice. But just like in church, we have wayward sheep. We really do. And you know what the shepherd does? He hires a dude called a hireling. That's why he's called a hireling, because he's paid to be there. He doesn't really want to be there. Because I don't know if you know this, but in biblical times, even today, if you look at the life of a shepherd, it's pretty, it's, you're like low class in Israel. I mean, these guys are out there and they're in the, in the dirt and in the dust and in the mire and in the, in the elements all the time with their sheep. And that hireling is there for his six to seven to eight hours. And you know what his job is? to go beat the wayward sheep, to get him back in line. And Jesus draws that incredible parallel. And then what was really cool, remember that, Sylvia, when we were sitting on the side of the hill? Right behind us, right behind us was this cave-looking cave. To me, it was a cave. And Jim Martin says, all right, look over your shoulders. Now, you know what that is? That's a sheepfold. This is where I put my sheep at night to keep the thief from stealing, killing, and destroying. He gathers them up and he puts them in this little cave-looking thing. And there's only one entrance into that little cave, into the sheepfold. And you know what Jesus calls himself in that passage in John 10? I am the what? I'm the door. I am the door. Nobody's going to come in and mess with my sheep. So Zachariah shows up. And he's revealing to the nation of Israel, man, that the Messiah is going to be this cool shepherd. So it's no coincidence that after Peter bails on him, right before he goes to the cross, remember that in the, in the Gospels, where Peter denies him, he leaves him? 
And then just a few days later, they reconnect where? Back up in Galilee. And they're up fishing, thinking their life is over because the Messiah's dead. He's been crucified. The Romans had their way. They're out there fishing, going back, doing the only thing they knew to do. And then they look from the boat and they say, wow, that looks like Jesus over there cooking this meal. Jesus had just caught some fish and he was cooking the fish and he ushers them over and Peter being ashamed was, I'm not sure why the Bible said, oh, I know exactly why he was naked at fishing. And he creeps in here, the fish naked over at Santa Cruz. I don't know, creepy people. That would be weird to see some naked dude at the lake. <laughs> On a boat, that's what Peter was doing. You know what nakedness represents in Scripture? You see that in back of Genesis, it's shame. He was ashamed. Because now he recognizes Jesus. And Jesus says, man, come over and let's have a meal. And like most psychiatrists, they would deal with denial issues. They, they didn't have couches back then, but on some rock, I'm sure, to deal with all his denial stuff. You know how Jesus dealt with his denial? He didn't. He asked him a very basic question. You know what he asked him? Peter, do you love me? That's what he asks us every day. Lord, of course I love you. Really, dude, do you really love me? Three times he asked him. You know why three? Making up for the three times. That's reconciliation the three times that he denied him. Do you really love me, dude? Yeah, Lord, I really do. And Jesus says, really, something profound. Then feed my sheep. I need you to be more than just a fisherman, right? Fishing is important, right? I'm going to make you fishers of men. That's evangelism. We need to be fishers of men. But we also need to be shepherds. That's discipleship. That's caring for the sheep. And you know what a lot of pastors are? They're hirelings. That they beat their sheep. When that shepherd is all about loving and caring for his sheep, protecting his sheep. Zechariah shows up and he says, the Messiah is going to be a shepherd, man. He's going to be the good shepherd and he's a cool shepherd. In verses 11 through 8, I'm sorry, verse 8 of chapter number 11, track with me in the book of Zechariah. I need to move this little light here. Um, look at verse, look at verse 8. Look what happens next. This sheep is also rejected by those people that he came to shepherd. Look at verse 8. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month. And, um, and my soul, my soul. Lo them, and their soul also abhorred me. Then said I, I will not feed you. That that dieth, let it die. And that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. And this is where they rejected Jesus for who he was. The very people that he came to save, the very people that he came to shepherd, that he loved and that he cared for, the very people that rejected him. And in verses 9 through 11, at his first coming, look what he does next. Look at verse 9. This is interesting. Then said I, I will not feed you. We already read that. Look at verse 10. And I took my staff, even beauty, and I cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day. And so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was, was the word of the Lord. And I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price. And if you think um, not forbear, so they wait for my price. And watch this one. Does this phrase ring a bell? 30 pieces of silver. So... There's a prophecy here that the very people that he came to save, he was sold out for a mere 30 pieces of silver. Rejected. And he broke the staff. In other words, there's always the shepherd's staff, right? 
the hireling uses it to beat the sheep. The good shepherd uses it to rein in the sheep. And um, in this passage, you see Jesus saying, all right, man, I'm done. Because he was sold for a mere 30 pieces of silver. So there's this profound and significant prophecy that you see. And anytime you find silver in the Bible, especially as it relates to what we just read here in Zechariah, and what you see playing out in the Gospels and in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, silver always represents, listen to this, the price of redemption. The price that Jesus paid for you and I. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that when we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be six things that are going to show up. Three dead things, wood, hay, and stubble, and three significant things. Gold, silver, and what? Precious stones. Gold in the Bible always represents who God is in your life. That represents deity, who he is. We should never lose perspective of lose sight of who the Lord is in our lives. And then silver represents what it is that he did for you in this life. And the third thing that is mentioned is precious stones. Because you know who he is and what he did, now you have a grasp and an understanding of why he left you here, and that is to see what? To see souls come to Christ. Stones or the lively stones represent people or souls in the scriptures. Always. Remember in the book of Joshua chapter number 5 when they crossed over the Jordan? And he says, I want you to build me a pile of stones as a remembrance of this day. And the question is asked in these exact terms, what mean ye these stones? We should know what stones mean in our Bible. You know what they mean? They represent those precious souls that are in our lives. Lost and saved. That's a perspective that only he can bring. And then you jump down to chapter number 11, verses 14 through 16, and look at how things begin to change in the book, in this passage. Look at verse number 14. Then the Lord asunder mine other staff, even bands that I might break, the brotherhood between Judah and Israel, and the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd, for lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that is broken, nor feed that that, the st that standeth still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the, what does he call this guy? The idle shepherd that gaveth the flock the sword it shall be upon his arm and upon his, watch this folks, listen closely to the text, his right eye and his arm shall be clean, dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Does that two, three verses ring a bell? Go ahead, Larissa. Who's he referring to in the text, you think? You're called, you nailed it. See what he just did? See what Zachariah just did? He jumped from talking about the first coming right smack into what? The guy that's going to show up at the tribulation period. With this gap in between called the church age. Are you seeing the connection? So he's doing exactly what Isaiah did. Now from this point on, you know what Isaiah, you know what Zachariah is going to focus on? You know what he's going to look at? The events playing out in the tribulation period and in his return. Could you put the timeline back up, Jay? Check this out. This is all Revelation 13 stuff, by the way. Right? Who's going to heal? Is it 12 or 13? Where he's, uh, where he's wounded. Chapter 13. Revelation, right? Where, where is that? At 13 or 12 or 13? 13. Check this out. You just went from reading passages about the first coming. The fact that he's a good shepherd, a good shepherd. The fact that he's going to be rejected. The fact that he's going to turn his back on Israel because that's what he does in the church age, right? He turns his back on the Jews after Stephen is so in Acts chapter number 7. And he opens up his kingdom to who? To the Gentiles. To the world. And now, guess who shows up? The very guy that we were talking about last week. This guy, the Antichrist, who's wounded when? You just heard, we just read about the wound there in verse number, which verse was that? 
Um, verse number 17. Now you're reading events and scenarios and folks that are showing up where? Over here. Still no reference to anything here. Why? Again, I'll remind you, she's a mystery. The church age is a mystery. Is everybody tracking? Is everybody with me? That you can't lose sight of. Don't lose, ever lose sight of the fact that you're dealing with a Jewish worldview of history and prophecy. And they don't see this valley called the church or the church age. So now we're going to continue reading. And now you're going to see a bunch of events that show up in the Bible relative to his coming. So look with me now at verse number, um, number chapter number 13, verses 8 through 9. So now some crazy stuff begins to happen. Chapter 13, and again, I'm just kind of jumping around because we're just highlighting stuff. There's so much in the book of, in the book of Zechariah. I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that um, we need to focus on some of these events. Now you're looking at some um, other things. Look what happens here in chapter number 13. Look with me in verses 8 and 9. It says in verse 8, and it shall come to pass that in the land, uh, look at verse 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. It's exactly what he'll do. And it, all, it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, that two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them, and I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my what? The Lord is my God. You know what you're seeing play out here? Exactly what God revealed to us in the book of Revelation about the number of Jews that will die during the tribulation period. You know how many will die? Two-thirds. That's Israel's judgment. One-third will survive. We're often referred to them as what? God's remnant. And guess where he takes them? Remember this from our study way back in the book of Revelation? To a place called Petra, also known as Bozra. And what does Bozra mean? Sheepfold. Isn't that cool? He's going to take him to a spiritual sheepfold, this one-third of the Jewish remnant that this guy, the Antichrist, is going to go after and destroy and literally kill. This is why you can't lose sight of the fact and you can't deny the fact that God's gathering this nation together. And for what purpose? Timeline, please? Check this out. Check this out. This period right here. Seven years. Seven years. The last three, as Jesus referred to them, is the what? The great tribulation. So Jesus warns them in Matthew chapter 24 that when these events begin to happen, when these things begin to play out, that they are to what? Flee where? Flee where? Flee where? Into the mountains, into the wilderness. Where is that? In Transjordan. At Petra. Bozra, the sheepfold. Why? Because he's the good shepherd. And who's going to chase them? Who's going to be killing them? The who? the who? We saw it last week. We saw it last week. The four horsemen of the apocalypse. The, apocalypse. the Antichrist. The Antichrist. The idol shepherd. The idol shepherd. It's going to get crazy it's town crazy in the tribulation period. The tribulation period. It's going to be a bizarre time. A bizarre time. So now, again, you're advanced and you're seeing all these events play out relative to these events. Because the one thing that God does over here, we know this event is being what, Michelle? The second coming of Christ. What's the purpose for the second coming? It's a rescue mission. It's a rescue mission that you and I get to be a part of. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Heaven opens, 
And man, an entire army comes down to go to war. We know that as the battle of what? The battle of Armageddon. Now, the battle of Armageddon is not just one small little battle that takes place up in Megiddo. It's actually a campaign. And you know where it begins? It begins down in the Sinai. There's two places in the Bible where God told Moses and Joshua to take off their shoes because where they stood is holy ground. You know what people don't realize? That God just laid out the path of the second coming of Christ. It's not like coming down from heaven straight to Jerusalem. Guess where he shows up first? In the Sinai. You know who he's avenging there? Do you remember the book of Obadiah? Remember that prophecy? Who's the book of Obadiah written to? Can you back up a couple, couple slides, Jay? To the, the one with the table with the three... Look at Obadiah. Look at Obadiah. What's that prophecy to? prophecy to? The Edomites. The Edomites. He's going to avenge the Edomites. Avenge the Edomites. Who was the father of the Edomites? Father of the Edomites. Esau. Esau. That ring a bell? That ring a bell. So much for the Abrahamic for covenant, the Abrahamic right? covenant. So much for the Abrahamic covenant because God's going to avenge what Edom did. What did Edom, what Edomites do to Israel? In the book of Numbers, they didn't let him get to the pass. They didn't get him. God said, here's a shortcut. Here's a shortcut. From Egypt, it took him literally. It's 311 miles from here to Denver. From Santa Fe to Denver, or Santa Fe to Las Cruces, was the distance from Goshen to the land of promise. And they encountered two major issues. The first one being the 12 spies and them freaking out. And God shut that God door, shut and that then when they started to backtrack, they ran into these guys. And you know what happened to the Edomites? They, they didn't let them cross. They didn't let them pass. They, let them pass. they wanted to charge wanted them. To charge them. And God says, all right. God says, all right. There's a whole prophecy written to these people. It's called the book of Obadiah. So that's why he starts in the Sinai, because he's going to avenge all this stuff that happened thousands of years ago. Why does God do that? God do that. Because God's not bound to time. There, remember Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10? From God, the beginning and the end of the same. So what the Edomites did to Israel way back by not letting them pass, it's also playing out today because all you have to see is who are the descendants of the Edomites. Esau. Esau. So all this stuff all playing out, all this stuff all continuing this stuff to happen. happen. Again, in verses 8 and 9, you see what God does with one, two-thirds of the nation of Israel. And then you get down to chapter 14, and let's look at some few verses here. Um, look at verse number 2, chapter number 14, verses 1 and 2. Behold, here's a phrase that is key, right, Marie? Behold the what? Behold the what? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Anytime you find the phrase, the what? The day of the Lord. What's the context? What's the context? The second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ. Always a reference to the second coming of Christ. Look at your tape, your little, how to study the Bible booklet. If you look at your words and your phrases list, anytime you see the phrase, you're going to see this phrase, day of the Lord, all over the prophets. Because the event, again, the Jews, oh, thank you, good job. Thank you, good job. Look over here. Look over here. Second coming. Second coming. Look at the first one. The, first one. the day of the Lord. The that day, day Lord. brightness, day cloud, brightness, whirl, cloud, whirl, morning, whirl, wine, press. wine press. Those phrases Those will give you context. Give you context. And the context, the context of, of the second coming, second coming right here in this verse, right begins, in this verse with begins with verse number um, one. Um, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and they spoil, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will, it says, gather, listen to this one, folks, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the house is rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against what? Those nations. 
and when he had fought he had in fought the in day of the battle. battle. In those three verses, you see a very explicit reference to a key event known as the judgment of the nations. And Jesus himself, in the Olivet Discourse, in Matthew chapter 24, made reference of God ultimately judging those nations that are going to be fighting against Israel during the Battle of Armageddon. And it's... Interesting or fascinating to see how things are starting to divvy up or play out in the Middle East today as those divisions begin to lay out. Because ultimately, as God makes his way up into what is known as the Jezreel Valley, the Valley of Megiddo, which is just south of Nazareth, that is known as the valley of decision that's where the major battle occurs. What's fascinating to me is Jesus grew up in Nazareth. So there's this one area in the southern part of the city known as the Nazareth Ridge, this hilltop where you can look down on the entire valley. Imagine Jesus as a 12-year-old boy looking, someday I'm coming back, and I'm going to lead an army through this valley. So after he makes his way through the valley of Jehoshaphat and, into, and heads back south to Jerusalem, guess where he's going to draw all these nations in what is known as the Mount of Olives. How do we know that? Look at the next verse. In Zechariah chapter number 4. And his feet shall stand in that day. There's, the, there's another second coming phrase. Are you with me? And in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed from the north, and half of it toward the south. What's going what's gonna to cause that mountain to collapse and open up? You guys remember that from the book of Joel, from the study in the Joel? Tell me, Kenny, a massive earthquake. A massive earthquake. If you were to go to this valley today, it's a really narrow little space. It's known as the Kidron Valley. Here's the Mount of Olives. Here's the Temple Mount. And Jesus was prophesying in Matthew chapter 24 about what was going to play out in this period, in this time. In Matthew 24, he was on the Mount of Olives looking across the Kidron Valley. As a matter of fact, I think there's a picture up there of this place this right here, place right check, here. This out. check this out. Here's the Mount of, Here's Olives. The Mount of Olives. This whole mount here. Whole mount this here. is the verse of the, 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 the mountain that we just read. Jesus is actually, you can't see this little church over here. But this little church right here is where Jesus sat and did his Matthew 24 prophecy. This valley right here is the Kidron Valley. Here's another view of this. This is... This is an old Russian Orthodox church that's right here. This church right here, which sits at the heart of the Kidron Valley, at the base of Mount of Mount of Olives. Guess what it's called? That. That. Here Isn't that fascinating? That fascinating. You know what happened? You know what this little area is here? Right in this little tree grove. These all this olive grove. Anybody know what that is? The Garden of Gethsemane. That's where Jesus, That's prayed where Jesus prayed before he went to the cross. To the cross. Who, would have thought Who would have thought that some 280 years later, years the, Byzantine, later the Byzantine Empire would have built a church right at the base of the Mount of Olives and call it the Church of All Nations. You know why? This is where he's going to judge those nations. You know what he's going to do? An earthquake is going to split this entire valley. The Mount of Olives, the, this is to the east, this is to the south. It's going to open up and God's going to gather all these nations in what is known as the judgment of the nations, the sheep and goat nations. And there it is revealed to you prophetically. prophetically. This is another area of the area of the Kidron Valley. You can't see that, but this is just to the south of this, where this church is. These pictures going looking to the to the east are taken from the Temple Mount. So imagine standing on the Temple Mount looking across the Kidron Valley and seeing the Church of All Nations. So Jesus, Jesus, guess where he's gonna show up? At the second coming of Christ. 
the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount. And he's going to split this valley wide open so that he could gather all these nations and deal with them once and for all. The judgment of the nation. You know how Zachariah is connecting these dots for us. And in verses 9 through 21, what happens next, and I want to get through this real quick because this is a really fascinating part of the chapter. Chapter number 14, and the Lord, look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. And the Lord shall be what? Shall be what? Shall be king over all the earth. There you go, man. There you go, man. You know what you're reading? You know what you're reading? The second half of those Isaiah 9, 6 verses. It's happening at the second. At the second. And the Lord shall be king, it says in verse 9. In verse 9. Over all the earth in that day, there is that phrase again, at the second coming of Christ, in that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. And all the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate unto the corner plate, and from the tower of, of, um, of Hamath Eel unto the king's witnesses, and men and shall men dwell shall in it, and there shall be no more utter, more utter destruction, destruction, but Jerusalem but shall be what? Shall be what? Safely inhabited. Safely Why? Inhabited. Because the Why? Prince because of Peace has finally arrived. He's finally there. Finally there. He's finally there. He's finally there. And now there's peace and, there's and security, peace security in this, in this crazy place crazy that we know today is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Verse number 12. Verse number 12. Listen closely to these words, folks. These words, folks. You know what, guys? We need to get some of these new lights. lights. <laughs> Thank you, Donnie. Thank you, Donnie. Watch verse number, Watch 12. verse number 12. And this shall, and be, this shall be the plague wherewith the, the Lord will smite, will smite all the people that have fought that against Jerusalem, and their flesh shall consume away, away while they stand while upon they stand their feet. Their and their eyes and their shall eyes consume shall away in their holes, and their, their tongues shall come shall consume away to their mouth. Man, God is avenging, and God is coming God not is as um, a sheep um, anymore. A sheep now he's showing up as a lion. Look at verse number 16. And it shall come to pass, come to pass that everyone that everyone is left that is of left all the nations, all the nations. Did, you catch that? did you catch that? These are the nations that are left nations over are after the second, after coming, the of second coming of Christ. Catch this. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall even go up even from go year up to from year, year to worship to the worship King, the, king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the what? To keep the what? There it is. There it is. To keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The Tabernacles. The seventh and last seventh feast. The last feast. The millennium. The millennium. God is now. God is now. And the millennial and temple, the is, millennial now temple built. is now built. Jesus is, Jesus is ruling from the, from the eternal sea. Verse, Verse number, 19. number 19. And if the family of the Egypt family go of not up, go not come up, not out, come not that out, have no, have no then they'll have, have no rain. Have no there rain. shall be there the shall plague where with the Lord, Lord will smite the heathen and come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Are you with me? Are you with me? You know what you're dealing with now? dealing with now. Timeline, please. Timeline, please. Watch this. Check this out. Check this out. This is a Jewish kingdom. Jewish kingdom. And you, whether you like it or not, not you guys, because you're saved. Your role's different, right? You're a priest and a king in the millennium, right? You're ruling and reigning with him. But all those nations that survive the second coming of Christ and make it through the second coming and into the and get into them, they are going to have to show up. At the Feast of Tabernacles, Tabernacles in, Jerusalem, in Jerusalem to worship the King. Worship the King. Tish. Tish. You got it. You got it. Yes. Yes. You got it. You got it. Right. Right. Hang on to that thought because we're going to cover a couple of thoughts. We're going to look at the millennium, that kingdom period, in the book of Revelation. Because really, where that event happens, where every knee, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, I'm going to show you ultimately where that plays out. That plays out. And it's a really fascinating place. And of all places, in the book of Revelation. 
So the kingdom's in place. The, kingdom's in place. the king has arrived. The, king has arrived. the, throne, is, the throne temple's is built. Temple's built. And every year, every year, every year in every September, year in September, people are going to have to send have to send their reps, their, their, reps, whoever, their whoever, to worship to the king worship in the king in and during and during feast of tabernacles. Feast of tabernacles. But you know what I find interesting? You know I find interesting. And this is the cool thing this about God. Cool thing about God. You still free. You still see free will playing out in. Playing out in. Zechariah chapter Zachariah 14. Chapter Why? 14. Why? Because there's going to be some there's nations that are going to refuse to even worship him, him. Worship him. In the millennium. In the millennium. Just like some of us like refuse to worship him in the church age. The church age. Free will is always a part of God's plan. Of God's plan. But there's always but consequences, there's always isn't there? What's the consequence? Look at the text. Look at the text. What's the consequence? What's the consequence. No rain. No rain. Drought. Drought. I wonder if that's what's happening that's in New Mexico, right Mexico right now. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. We've been back We've however been back number of years, 27 years. 27 years. And I've only seen the Tsuki River dr completely dry, dry twice. Dry twice. Once about once eight about years ago, we had a really bad drought. Really bad drought. And just yesterday, and just yesterday, it's dry. It's dry. Coincidence. Coincidence. Maybe not so. Maybe not so. Right, Ollie. Right, Ollie. Did you drive by recently? Drive by recently. She lives across the street from me. Across the street from me. The Siki River's dry right now. Dry right now. That's what's going to happen. Look at verse number 19. There shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not to keep the coming of the tabernacles. And that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord and the pots of the Lord's house shall be like the bulls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that shall prescribe shall take of them and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the house. Of the Lord, of the Lord, of hosts, of hosts, and that's how Zechariah ends. ends. Now, let me, let me share with you just a few thoughts, thoughts out of the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation. So, go ahead and turn with me to with the millennium chapter, millennium chapter, the kingdom chapter in, chapter your Bible, in your Bible. That you just got a glimpse, glimpse of all these events, of all these events from Zechariah's perspective. perspective. Now, let's see what now John see says what about John that event. About Look at Revelation 20. Revelation this is your, this is your New Testament, New Testament perspective, perspective of, of the kingdom to come. Kingdom to Again, come. that yeah. is always that is and always has always been always has the been. theme of the Bible. Of the Bible. So when Jesus so shows up and he's laying out, he's laying out what we know today is the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount was nothing more than Jesus than Jesus. Laying out the laying constitution, out the constitution of, his of his kingdom. This is how things this are going to run. Are gonna run. When, he, when he, go look at Matthew look at chapters Matthew, five, six, and seven someday, someday to get that whole constitution, that whole constitution thing, down. thing down. So, so when you get to Revelation, get to chapter, Revelation 20, chapter twenty, there's some really, there's some really interesting, interesting things that are said, that are said um, um, relative to this relative whole thing. The first thing I want to talk to you about is is this kingdom to come. The reason for His kingdom. Did you bring that little piece of the outline? Because I want you to see how it breaks out. It breaks out. Um, um, a little um, outline of Thy kingdom come, Jay. Check this out, you guys. Check this out, you guys. This is no too far. No too far. I'll go back maybe two. Back maybe two. One more? One more. Maybe one more. Maybe one more. That one. That one. This is how the this book of Revelation book chapter, chapter 20, 20, breaks out. 20 breaks out. What you're going to see there, you're going to see in the first few verses, the reason for his reason for his kingdom. The reason why reason Jesus why returns Jesus is what the whole second whole coming thing is about. Thing is about. And Revelation chapter and Revelation 20 chapter is the proof text, text for the believer, for the in, believer in the New Testament in relative to Jesus' kingdom, that whole millennial thing. thing. The second part the second in this, in part verses 4 through 6, you're going to look at his reign and some things that I want us to consider relative to his reign. And then, believe it or not, because of free will, at the end of the millennium, there's a rebellion. There's a rebellion. Another rebellion. Another rebellion. Mankind just doesn't Mankind get it. Just huh? doesn't get it. Huh? Jesus comes back, he sets up his kingdom, up his kingdom, and then guess what happens? And guess what happens? The devil is the loose one last time, last and he wreaks havoc. He wreaks havoc. And then you know what Jesus and does? He shuts, shuts it down once and it down once and for all. Timeline, please. Timeline, please. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. Check this out. Check this out. So when he shuts it down so at the end of the thousand years, guess what happens last? Next, last, next. The last part of Revelation, which we're really not going to cover that. We know what happens. The last and final judgment. Final judgment. And guess who? Guess who gets cast in there? Cast in there. The devil. The devil. The antichrist. The antichrist. And the lost. And the lost. 
And you know who some of those lost people, people are? Lost people are your friends and your, your relatives. relatives and your relatives. Guess where they're going to be cast? They're going to be cast to the lake of fire. The lake of fire. That's eternal. That's eternal. I was sharing with somebody sharing just with a couple weeks ago when we were discipling. We were, like, he was asking me about, asking me about the difference between the difference hell and the lake of fire. The lake of fire. Liken it like this. Liken it like this. Anybody ever drive down, ever highway, drive 14? down highway 14? Go down a few miles and a few miles. That's where Kristen works. She doesn't work at the actual jail. Marvin works there. Marvin works there. But the county jail? The county jail. That's hell. That's hell. You know what it is? It's a holding place. It's a holding place. It's a holding place until the person that has committed a crime goes to before what? Before what? A judge. A trial. A judge. A trial. That's what the great white throne judgment is. Their trial. Their trial. And then once and they once go through that, they trial, through that trial, then they're cast then they're eternally, cast eternally across, highway 14, across Highway 14 to the penitentiary. The penitentiary. That's long-term, baby. That's long-term, baby. You're there for the long haul. You're there for the long haul. From a Bible perspective, Bible perspective that's, that's eternal. eternal. That's eternal. That lake of fire that is eternal. Fire is and I believe it will burn eternally. 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 On this planet, on this planet I, believe I believe in a literal hell, a literal, hell, a literal lake, of fire, fire, lake of fire. And I believe you, and can, I believe identify you exactly can identify exactly where it is on the map, where it is on the map today. An interesting place in the Middle East. The Middle East. There's all these There's cool, all hints, these cool hints. hints. Or truths that the, or truth, the Spirit of God reveals in His Word about where that lake of fire is going to be. And yes, it's on, and this, yes, planet. It's on this planet. On this planet. You know what He's going to do? He's, he's going to raise up hell. hell. And at the and at the, at the judgment seat of Christ, Christ, all those lost all souls, lost souls, will stand before Him. Before Him. One last time, one last the Bible time, refers to Bible refers the judgment of the great white throne. Great white throne. That has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. But you know what's scary and what's sad and what's heartbreaking? What's heartbreaking? You and I will be present. I will be present. We'll be witnessing. We'll be witnessing. All those that we know, all those that we love, that we love, all those that we care for, care for, that will ultimately end up because of that rejection that they did in this life, in this life, in that life, in that life. And the Bible refers to it as the second death. Second death. They died once the first time, the first time, and then they died a second time, second time, eternally, eternally, at the lake of fire, lake of fire. Yes, I believe when it comes to the word of God, I'm a literalist. And we're going to share with you some thoughts as to what and why that's important when it comes to this kingdom, this kingdom thing. So in chapter 20, chapter 20, you find a reference in the first three verses to to um. Um, the purpose for, the his, purpose kingdom. for his kingdom. Again, that is the that theme is of the, the Bible. You, of can the Bible. Never, you can ever, ever, ever lose, ever lose sight of that truth. Of that truth. God, is God is restoring and he's redeeming a fallen, fallen kingdom. kingdom. That fall that happened, fall happened way, back way back in Genesis, in Genesis between Genesis, Genesis 1 and Genesis 1, 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 1, 1, 1 and 2. That's where the fall began. When Lucifer led a rebellion. And God created, and God created this created place this called, place hell, called hell, hell, the county jail, the county jail for the devil for and the his devil angels, and never, angels for people. never for people. But that begins but that to play begins out because part of God's plan was to restore what fell. What fell. Not at the garden, Not but in eternity, eternity, past. eternity past. So when God, so when creates, God creates and restructures and the universe as we know it today, and he does it all in six days, when you get to chapter get to 2, chapter verse, two one, verse 1, he says, and he, he rested, rested on the, the one, the what? The seventh, the day. seventh day. So he sanctified so he the seventh day. He set the seventh day apart. Well, if you study that timeline, if you go through that timeline, that timeline, there's only 6,000 six years, six years between the fall of Adam and Eve to where we're at today, to, we're to at the today, second, coming, the of second Christ. coming of Christ. From Adam, From Adam to Noah was 1,000 years. years. From, Noah years. Years. From, From Noah to Abraham was 1,000 years. years. 2,000 years. years. From Abraham to the Abraham first temple, first Solomon's temple, was 3,000 years. years. From Solomon's temple to Jesus, 4,000 years. From Jesus to the Dark Ages, 5,000 years. From the Dark Ages to today, 6,000 years. years. And you know what God did? You know what God did? Timeline, please. Timeline, please. He rested, he rested on the what? On the what? On the seventh day. On the seventh day. A day with the Lord is a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. You know what you're saying over here? Saying over here. Last thousand years. Last thousand years. And it's a day of rest. A day of rest. That's what. That's what. 
the Sabbath means. That's, that's what the seventh that's day is about. Day is this about. period right here, period finally, right here, finally, the world and the, the planet, planet, is planet is at rest. Is at rest. So, now, so now, as you get into these, get first, into these first several verses in the book of Revelation, chapter number 20, you begin to see the reason of the purpose of the kingdom. Look at verse number um. Uh, look at verse number one. Verse number it says, one. And I saw an says, angel saw come an down, angel from heaven, down from heaven, and, he ha and having the and key having of the bottomless, key of the bottomless pit, pit, and a great, and chain, great chain in his hand, and he laid the dragon, that old serpent, that old which, serpent is which is the devil, and Satan, and bowed him, him for how long? For how long? For a thousand for years. years. And he cast him and he into cast the bottomless, the bottomless pit, and shut up, and he set up a seal that he should deceive the nation. Who did he deceive the nation? No more. No more. Till the thousand Til years shall be fulfilled. Years and, and after that, he must be loosed for a little while. For a little while. Verse 4, And Verse I saw four, thrones, and, I saw and they that sat upon it, and judgment, and given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And that which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had he received his mark upon the foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and they reigned with Christ for how long? For how long? thousand years thousand years these are the these people are the that people survive, survive the tribulation period again we don't have time to do a breakdown or break down to unpack the book of revelation but here's what i'm going to do here's what i'm going to do and kind of mention this earlier this earlier come come august or september we're going to do a little mini series called unlocking the end times the end times so we're going to focus and we're going to drill down and we're not going to get into that whole revelation stuff in great detail but we're going to we're going to lay out some of these events that are going to happen that are going to happen so look at the next part of the verse. Part of the verse. Look at the next part of the passage. So now you have a now you have a the 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 promise of his kingdom coming to fruition. Fruition. And then there's a period that you see of his kingdom, which is this this thousand year reign. You know it is the millennium, and it's a literal reign. It's a literal kingdom that's going to last a thousand years. And here's something that I'm here to consider. And Jay's going to bring this next slide up. But there's a way that people, or different ways that people interpret this whole concept of the kingdom. And look at this chart real quick. There's three worldviews that I want you to consider. This is a this is a theological term, theological term which means biblical interpretation. interpretation. People are going to interpret the Bible one of two ways. One of two ways. Has anybody ever heard the term? Ever heard the term? In other words, the Bible is just a bunch of stories and stories, just little kind of little kind of spiritual symbolic things. That's what an allegorical worldview of the Bible is. And then there's the literal view. literal view. Those of us that take the Bible literally, in a biblical worldview, we're referred to as as premillennialists. What do you suppose? What do you suppose the word premillennialist means? Before the millennium. Before the what millennium. before the rapture? Right before the millennium. Before the millennium. No, not the rapture, no, not because the rapture has nothing to do with the kingdom, kingdom right? With the kingdom, right? The second coming. The we second believe the second coming, coming is going to happen, happen before the millennium. Before the millennium. Well, those folks well, that those take, folks take a more allegorical, more allegorical view, post millennial view, millennial view, like the Roman like Church the and the Roman Eastern Church, what we know today as Catholicism, theirs is considered a post millennial. What's the implication? What's the implication? That mankind will mankind usher in the kingdom. Usher in the kingdom. That mankind, mankind will be in charge, in charge in bringing about, in bringing about the return about of Jesus. In other words, in other hey, we're gonna do, we're gonna build this massive facility in Dubai, in Dubai for the for the for the, for, the, for, for, Islam, for, Islam, for all the Abrahamic religions. Abrahamic we're gonna bring we're peace gonna on earth. All right, Jesus, now you can come down. Now you can come down. That's what that's what a post-millennial post worldview consists, world consists of. And then you have the then you Protestant have Protestant world, which is all millennialism, all millennialism, or a millennialism, or a millennialism. And that just means that just things means are going to continue on like they always have. have. They always have. And that's a typical that's a view, view of a lot of Christians. Of a lot of Christians today. Seriously, seriously, totally oblivious of what's really going on in the world and on the planet and on the planet. And the fact that we're seeing a convergence of things happening like never before. Like never before. And we allegorize everything. We allegorize everything. And you know what these guys do? These guys do. And really, it happens really here as happens well. Happens here as well. The church replaced the church Israel. Replaced Israel. And God. And God. That's the idea. That's the idea. So you want to know why so anti-Semitism anti show, it's show its ugly head again? Ugly head again. And why Jews are going to be persecuted like never before like again? Never before again. This allegorical this perspective allegorical of the scriptures, because you know what? Because you know what? They're not. They're just wannabe Jews. They're just, Jews. They're just fake Jews. Jews. We're the real Jews. We're the real Jews. 
It's called replacement it's called theology with theology. And it's so prevalent so today, prevalent like, ever today like ever before. Where you just made you God just out made to, be a liar. to be a liar. Because God said, because I'm going to restore, said, restore these, people, these people in a literal, in a literal land, literal land, in a literal purpose, in a literal, purpose, in a literal plan, in a literal, plan in a literal kingdom, in a literal kingdom. And I'm going to be king. I'm going to be king. Because whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, know it or not, your Jesus, your Savior, was a Savior, was a Jew. From the tribe of Judah. tribe of Judah. Now he holds a special place and a unique role for the church. Don't get me wrong, man. Don't get me wrong, man. You are not his. You are not his. Praise God. You know what we are. You We're his bride. We're his bride. You're his church. You're his church. Man, a unique entity. You know other people. I say this all the time. I say this all the time. No other people have the privilege of having the spirit of God in the world. God in the world. But the church age. The church age. That's why three times in Romans, in Galatians, and in Colossians, Paul says there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Jew and the Greek. It's not about your race. It's not about your nation. It's about your nation. It's about your heart. It's about your heart. And whoever receives Jesus, this side of the rapture. the rapture. From the book of Acts, the book of Acts. Whoever receives him, whoever receives him, is no no is longer considered no longer brown, brown, black, brown, white, black, green, white, whatever. Green, whatever. Whatever. You know what you are. You know what you are. You're a so, you're, you're a, a so, child of the king. Child of the king. You are a son and you are a son, son of God. You're a son of God. You're a child, you're a child of, of Almighty God. Almighty God. So so black man, black man. If you really want to solve really want the, racial solve divide, the racial divide, let's get people let's saved get people because you know what? God's color blind. God's color blind. The church. The church. And that's the beauty that's of the, the church. Beauty of the church. Go read. Go read. Both Revelation Both chapter Revelation four and five, four and five, where, where, where people from every, every tongue and every nation, nation are going to be praising and worshiping praising together, worshiping man. Together, man. Finally, finally. And you know what's so sad you know to say? So sad to say. That one of the most, one of the most segregated, segregated days, days, days in our culture today our culture is Sunday today mornings. Is Sunday mornings. Where we have black churches, have white, black churches, churches green white churches, green churches, and that's why I love and our church. I love our red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue, man. No, that's not true. No, that's not brown, true. white, and green. Brown, white, and green. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That is what is so that cool. That is what man. is so cool, man. This is what God this is what God designed. This is what He is what He intended when He created this he created amazing this thing called, called the church. church. Called the church. But there is a time but coming. There is a time coming. Once this rapture Once thing happens, this thing happens, and he's done, he's done with this whole race thing, he's going to deal with nations. The judgment of the nations. The judgment of the nations. Nations is always nations is always ethnic groups. Ethnic groups. Ethnic groups. And there's going to be ethnic groups that are going to follow, and they're going to support Israel, the support nations, and there's going to be the goat nations. The goat nations. And God will and deal God with those will nations those accordingly. accordingly. So now we're back to now circle, we're back to full circle, man. Kingdom, kingdom. His kingdom's coming. His kingdom's coming. Whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, like and it not, it's going to be it's literal. literal. It's going to be it's going physical. physical. It's going to be Jesus. Jesus. Every eye is going to see him. Going to see him, right? When he comes when for the church, 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 the rapture, the rapture. Guess who sees yes, who Just sees you. Him. Just you. We're meeting him in the clouds. We're meeting him in the clouds. But at the second coming, the, the second whole world's going to see, see, see him. They're going to witness. They're going to witness it. And it's then, it's then, tish, tish, where every knee, every knee will bow, and every, bow, and every tongue, tongue will confess, will confess. Every, every. The tongue means, the tongue means languages. Every languages, tongue will confess, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ, that Jesus is Christ is the Lord. That He is, that He is, who the Word of God the said, the Word of God he, was. said he, was. he was. Everything that Everything we just read in Isaiah, man. Isaiah, man. The Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace, the Everlasting, the Everlasting King, King, the Almighty, the Almighty, the Almighty, the Almighty God, God, the Almighty God. That's who Jesus That's Christ, Christ Jesus Christ is. So, so, just a quick glance at Revelation, 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 Revelation twenty. With this, we're going to close now. We're going to close now. Revelation twenty is in proof text on the millennium. Study it out, break it out, unpack it out, unpack. Because when you get to verse eleven, verse eleven. That's a heartbreaking. That's a heartbreaking passage. But hang with me. But hang with me. Because this fall we're going to unpack and we're going to look at details. details. And, I will, and I will share with you. And I will show you, you exactly where this lake of fire place is going to be. Is going to be. And how it's going to play. How it's going to. All right. All right. We have time for one or two questions. One Michelle. Michelle. No, you're good. No, you're good. We're just going to give you your own mic. Give you your own mic. So in, in so Zachariah, 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 they, they uh, uh, people
people still people continue, still to, continue have to have free, have free yes. will yes. in the millennium. In the millennium. So, so hence, as, as the church, the church ruling with Jesus ruling Christ, with Jesus Christ, Christ as, priests, as priests and, and kings, and kings, and kings. It, it only it tells, it me only tells me that maybe one of maybe our one of our many roles many roles would be to minister, to minister these people, these people that have free will. Have free you got it, man. You got it. You got it. You got it. Do you think everybody you think in this everybody room hang out in Jerusalem? Hang out I don't think so. I don't think so. That's the beauty of the morning. That's millennium. the beauty of the morning. We didn't really didn't touch on that. Really didn't touch on that. Touch on that. Touch on that. Did everybody get her question? Everybody get her question. She nailed it. She nailed it. You will be spread out. Be spread out. Have no idea where. No idea where. I think it's going to be depend on where and what you did this side of eternity. Side of eternity. Some of you might end up in. Might end up in. What's that? What's that? Blue Hill. The Blue Hill. That little town. That little town. No way, the sick as were. No, no, yeah, no, down no, in no, the, yeah, down in the, the, the little the, tiny the, town, the tiny little town in Mexico. In Mexico. Pecos, Pecos, Pecos would be Pecos would one be step down from one step down from the sick as. Right, Tim. Right, Tim. It's gonna be, it's gonna be Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Tzuki, Pecos, Pecos, and then there's that place in there, that place in the Blue Hill. I forget what it's called. I forget what it's called, man. Las Cruces, Las Cruces. Did I offend any of you? Offend any of you? Come on, man. What's the name, on, of, the place, the name of the know? place, Danny? Do you know? Near, no, no, further, no, south, no, than further down. south than Denver. It's like this little hole, like in, the this wall. Little hole in the wall. Columbus. 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 Maybe it's Columbus. Columbus. Maybe it's Columbus. Anywhere. Anywhere. Somewhere, Somewhere out there. Somewhere out there. Man, you don't want to end man, up there, man. You don't want to end up there, man. Or it's just one or step up, one, one lake of fire, a lake of fire. Right? Right? Seriously. Seriously. We will be scattered. We will be scattered. We will be scattered among the nations. among the nations. And you know what you're going to be doing? You're going to be doing? You're going to be reigning? You're going to be reigning? You're going to be ministering? ministering? Revelation chapter Revelation five. chapter five. You're a priest. You're a priest. And a king. And a king. To those folks. To those folks. Wherever the wherever the place you just to place you. Oh, well, that's 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 that's. If you're really really you're really really focused, really, really, really focused on your focused on your love and your love love mission and your permission of God, you're gonna end up in a place like Tsuki. place like Tsuki. If not, you're gonna end up not. You're gonna end up in Mexico, Blue Hill, Mexico, Blue Jack, I'm surprised you don't know. You probably fought fires down there. Fires down there. What's it called? What's it called? Columbus. You Columbus. You Columbus. Columbus. Aren't you the Valle? Aren't you the Valle? I don't know. It's gonna be hot though. It's gonna be hot though. It'll be hot. It'll be hot. I know where Kenny wants to end up. Wants to end up, man. Up near Alamosa. Near Alamosa. Those fourteen and Jack. Jack. God's good, man. God's good, man. I don't know how it's going to play out. I don't really know. I don't really know how it's going to play out. I do know this. I do know this. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back as king. Coming back as king. But before he comes back to this planet, he's going to come back for his church. For his church. Because of his love. Because of his love for you. Because of your decision. Because of your choice. Because of your choice to follow him, to follow receive him, him, to accept him. He indulged you with his love. And now you have the power to empower this world. Impact this world. You and I do together. You that's our together. calling. That's our calling. So I'm going to say it again. So I'm going to say it again. This. I'm going to close with this. This side of eternity, this side of eternity, eternity refers, to us as refers to us as ministers, ministers, right? right? right. We're here to what? We're here to what? The work of the, the ministry. Of the ministry. That's not a that's not a, that's not a title. Not a title. Jim McCormick always Jim used to McCormick introduce always used to introduce me as his minister. His minister. Jim, I'm not Jim, a minister. I'm not you're a minister. minister. We're, We're all ministers. ministers. We're all ministers. We're all to be. We're all to be a minister. That's the calling. That's the calling. So so. That said, that said, this side of eternity, this side, this side of the rapture, this side of the rapture. You know what this life is. You know what this life is. It's practice. It's practice. It's practice. It's practice. What are we practicing? What are we practicing for? Wherever he's going to lead you, he's going to lead you and take you during the millennial reign. During the millennial reign, I have no idea where and how. Idea where and how. But keep growing, man. Keep growing, keep man. Keep knowing and realizing and realizing. Larissa. You know what? Here's the issue. Here's the issue. Here's what's really cool. The people will still be coming. The people will still be coming. But salvation is you and I know. You and I know. It's just going to be. It's just going to be a means. How did it play out? How did it play out in the Old Testament? Jewish feasts, Jewish feasts, Jew exactly, exactly. We're back to ceremony. Back to ceremony. We're back to some kind of legal. You know what? Legal you, you know what? Really you know really want to study how? Want to study how rules for a lack of better for a lack of better for a lack of How things are going to play out? Things are going to play out. Go lay out. Go lay out and study and study. Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. Five, six, and seven. The Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. That's his constitution. That's his constitution for the kingdom. 
That's what he intended, and that's what he planned, that's what he brought the disciples together, and they did together. This is how my kingdom, this is how my kingdom. And how does it begin? How does it begin with the attitudes? The attitudes. Blessed are those people. Blessed are those people. Just study those study chapters, read chapters. And that's how he's going to run his kingdom. And there's going to be somebody out there. Somebody out there. Somewhere. 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 I don't know where. I don't know where. Probably Tim's kingdom. Probably Tim's kingdom. He's going to say, no, we don't want to do this. We don't want to do this. We're going to go to a Bronco game. We're going to go to a Bronco game instead. And then we're gonna pray for you. Then we're gonna pray for you. Be all you Bronco. Be all you Bronco. Bernadette. Bernadette. Did free will begin when the fall happened, or was that God's original design? Here's the cool thing about God. Thing about God. Oh man, I have this really oh, cool quote by C.S. Lewis that I would love, love to read to you. Let me see if um, I can just find it. Right 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 but I'll, I'll let you know when it happened. I'll let you know when it happened. Your, your question your, is: When you say the fall, you mean Adam and Eve's fall? No, you know where the you know where the real fall happened. Where the real fall happened? The real fall. The real fall. The real Lucifer. Lucifer. The timeline. The timeline. Can you bring up the timeline here? The timeline here, real quick. Check this out. Check this out. It happened out here. It happened out here. This thing exists this thing because exists of what happened. Because of what happened out here. Right, can you read that right, little, you little, read word that right little word right here? It says eternity past. Eternity past. So what you see so happening in this whole timeline, whole timeline, and I know, and I know, because we're because Western, Western civilization, civilization people, 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 we see everything in near terms, 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 near terms. They're actually going through. They're actually going full circle. So you get to Revelation so 21, 21, 21 after the millennium, after, after the whole great white throne. You know what we see? You know what we see? New heaven, new heaven, and a new earth, and a new earth, and a new Jerusalem, and a new Jerusalem. We're back to how we're things were how things were before this. Before this. So when did the free will happen? When the free will happen. In Ezekiel chapter Ezekiel 28, chapter 28, the anointed chair and covered chair and covered guy named Lucifer. Guy named Lucifer. He says, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of doing this, man. He let the details are laid out. Details are laid out. Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter number 14. The five, the five, what, what, I wills, I wills. I will be like the I will be like the I will sit on I will sit on the throne of God. Who said that? Who said that? Lucifer. Lucifer. And this text right this here text calls right him out by name. Calls him out by name. A lot of the modern translations, modern translations, translations called you know, in, in, in that verse, in, that, in, in that verses, verses, in those verses. Oh Lucifer, oh Lucifer, how it's fallen, how it's fallen. You know what he's referred to as? referred to as? What do you think? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The morning star. The morning star. Guess who else is called? Guess who else is called the morning star? Jesus. Jesus. In Revelation 20, Revelation 22. He's Lucifer. He's Lucifer. He's Lucifer. He led the rebellion. He led the rebellion. That dude. That dude he held a unique, he held place, a unique place in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom. He held a unique place. He held he a unique place. The, the, there's only there's only five cherubim five that are mentioned, cherubim in the Bible. mentioned in the Bible. There's different levels there's different of angelic levels beings. angelic beings. There's the Godhead, the Godhead, the Father, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit. And then there were the five cherubim, the five cherubim, the one, one in this case, in this case, and, and then the four that surround the throne. Surround the throne. Below them is below them is angels called the seraphim, seraphim, and they show up in like Isaiah chapter six, wherever six, wherever. They're on the outskirts of the throne. They're on the outskirts of the praising and praising. They're the worshiping. They're the ones that were. The Bible refers to Bible with Job as the sons of God. That was God praises on the Lord praises on the fall for the fall, right? Right. And then below them the are the archangels. Are two, of them two of them mentioned in the Bible, right? In the Bible, right? Michael and Gabriel. Michael and Gabriel. Michael. And below the archangels, below the archangels there's probably more. There's probably more. Michael is Michael the, is the defender, of Israel. defender of Israel. Gabriel is the proclaimer of the proclaimer of the coming Messiah. Coming Messiah. Wherever Gabriel shows Wherever up, Gabriel shows up. And below and below the archangels, the archangels are the angels. Are the angels. Now, now, one third, one third of all those angelic, all those angelic beings, beings at the highest level, the highest the level, level to the lowest level, level fell. That's why that timeline exists. That timeline exists. To restore, to restore what, fell. what fell. Not here, not here, but here, but here. You got it. You got it. You nailed it. You nailed it. That's why you That's exist. That's why you exist. He's restoring. He's, he's restoring. redeeming. He's redeeming. So here's a really, here's a really cool. You're gonna hear a cool thought. You're gonna hear a cool thought. Adam and Eve, they show Adam up over Eve, here. They show up over here. Genesis chapter Genesis 1, verse 26, 26, 26, 26, 27, 28, 28 and that gives them, them their commission. Their commission. Tells them to do three Tells things. Them to do three things. Be fruitful and be fruitful. Multiply, multiply and do what? Multiply and do what? 
replenish, replenish. What does the word replenish mean? Word replenish mean? Put back, put back. Replenish means to put something back. Put something back. What's the implication? What's the implication? There was something. There was something around. Both around. For for Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. It was called. It was the called sons of God. The sons of God. Job chapter six. Job chapter six. Thirty seven. Thirty eight. Thirty eight and thirty nine. Great chapters. Great chapters. Great chapters. They revealed. They revealed, revealed to me in great detail. detail in great detail of what was going on. What was going on before the fall. Before the fall. Sons of God, sons of God. Okay, okay. That's just big picture. That's just stuff. big picture stuff. Can I repeat? What kind of repeat? What kind? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Larissa, <laughs> Larissa, <laughs> Larissa, Larissa, Larissa. Point. Larissa's point. So is this why? So is this why we were created? We were created, right? So when God so creates, God creates Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. For Adam. For Adam. It's really cool. It's really and you're going to cool. learn this discipleship. One lesson one, one into especially. One into especially. This is what's really cool. What you were created, created, created in God's image. Image, 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 image is likeness. His likeness. One speaks of one how speaks he lived, how he spiritually and spiritually, and how he was, how he was, and how he looked, and how he looked physically. Well, at, after the well, fall, after the fall, Adam didn't. Adam did God lose God. Last he still had a body. Still had a body. But now he lost. Now he lost image. Image. So when so Adam and Eve has Adam Seth, Eve have Seth. Adam is now Adam is now I'm sorry, Seth is now created now after created after Adam's image. Adam's image. Genesis chapter Genesis five, verse chapter five. five, verse five. Now now Eve and Herod even inherited a fallen image. A fallen image. So when you got so saved, you got saved in the New Testament, in the New Testament. Not Israel and not Israel and you and I get saved, you and I get saved because what God did, guess what God did. When he indwelled you with his spirit with his spirit. He restored his image. Restored his image. There's the redemption. There's the redemption. There's the plan. There's the plan. Rome, book of Romans. Romans book of Romans stuff. From Romans, from Romans chapter Romans one, all chapter Romans one, chapter eight. Romans chapter eight. Make sense? Make sense? Okay. Okay. So, so we can never lose sight. Never lose sight. Ever lose sight of every picture, 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 picture ever. Or we'll get we'll caught up. Get caught up in the details. The details. We don't even know why the church exists. Why the church exists? Which is unfortunate. Which is unfortunate. We go to church on Sunday. We go to church on Sunday because we've always gone to church. No man, no man. The church is the church of urgency. Of urgency. That's what we can't That's forget. What we can't forget that she holds a place. She holds a place in the unique place in God's purpose and God's plan. This whole thing called grace and everything that He's done and everything He's done. Look at the little subtitle underneath. It God's plan for the one for the what for the ages for the ages. God's plan for God's ages. Plan for you know what an age is? You know what an age is? In the Bible, a period, the Bible, of, time. A period of time. That's all it is. That's all it is. And there's seven, and there's distinct, seven distinct ones in the Bible known, the Bible as, known as dispensation, dispensations. And in every one of these little one of blue these humps, little blue humps, God His God manifested His, his grace. grace. His grace. In a certain way, in a certain time, for a certain time, for a certain people group. And in every one of every those, one of those, if you look at the little black, the little, the little black legend here, here, legend here, that was the that failure of the steward. Steward chapter sixteen, chapter sixteen. The steward of that dispensation, the dispensation, the responsibility. responsibility. In Adam Eve's case, Adam Eve's case, the curse, the curse. What's Adam's curse? What's Adam's curse after the fall? After the fall. And everybody here can everybody here can vouch on this vouch on this one, man. You have to go to work. You have to go to work. That's why Justin's here, man. He has to go to work. He has to go to work. I hate getting up in the morning and going to my job, going to my job. That's why I can't wait to retire to retirement. Ladies, what was your curse? What was your curse? Pain. Pain. A childbirth. A childbirth. I don't know. I don't know how much Larry how much Larry Larry went. Man, Larry I went fell for her. I fell for her. <laughs> I was in the room. I was in the room. What did I do to her? What did I do to her? I felt responsible. I felt responsible. <laughs> Is she? Gosh, I guess so. I guess so. She's looking at me. She's I should kill you right now. I should kill you right now. And then, and then, conscience kicks. Conscience kicks in. What does conscience what mean? What does conscience mean? Corn. Science with knowledge. With knowledge. 
Now they know the now difference they know between the good, good and evil. Why? Because they took the tree of the knowledge of the knowledge. That was never God's intent. God's, God's plan, plan for them was always, them was to, live always to live forever. Here's the tree of life. Here's the tree of life. You know what's cool? You know what's cool? Guess where the tree of life is? Guess where the tree of life is? in the Bible. Revelation 20. Revelation 21. That's, it's crazy yes, town. It's crazy that's eternity. Town. That's eternity. Now we're looking beyond. Now we're looking beyond. beyond the end of the millennium. The end of the millennium. Great millennium. Great millennium. Great millennium. Great millennium. Revelation chapter Revelation chapter one is the new heaven and new earth. Eternity, eternity, future, future. God's gone full circle. God's gone full circle. And this place called this Earth, place called Earth, it's a special place, man. special place, man. It's a privileged, it's a privileged planet. planet. We have no clue have about, no God's, about God's plan and purpose, plan and purpose for this planet. This is why, this is why you go one verse in the Bible, one verse in the Bible, showing up, and it's showing up, and God created the heaven and the earth, heaven and the earth. And then at the end, and then at the end, when he says, when he says, and I saw a new heaven, and a new heaven, and a new what? And a new earth, and a new earth. One of these days, I'll share. These days, I'll share some thoughts about some things in the cosmos. In the cosmos, that are interesting. Are interesting. The uniqueness of this place, of this place, where God has positioned it, and God's plan, God's plan. That's what we can't forget. We can't forget. There's more to this. More to this. Can I show something really crazy and really crazy and really weird? And we'll close with this. And we'll close with this. I promise. I've got Romans chapter got Romans one, chapter one, 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 verse one in my fingers, all the way to the all the way to the book of Philemon. Philemon. Romans to Philemon. Romans to Philemon. Are you with me? Are you with me? That's between my two That's fingers. My two fingers right here. This is this what is, is written. What is written to the body of Christ. The body of Christ. To that church age. That church age thing. So who's all this other stuff? All this other stuff. All this other stuff. All this other stuff about. That's the plan. That's the plan. That's what you got to figure out. You got to figure out. So you know what God's giving you. God's giving you. He's giving you. He's giving you the the puzzles. Puzzles. The pieces to the pieces to the puzzle and the picture. Right. Have you ever tried to? Have you ever tried to do a puzzle without looking at the Looking at the box and the colors and the colors and all the other stuff and all the other stuff. That's what most Christians what do. Most Christians do. They're trying to. They're trying to puzzle together. Puzzle they have no together. idea. Have no idea what the puzzle even the puzzle is. A blank. Is a blank box to them. Box to them. This, this is, is the puzzle box. The puzzle box. And these are all these the are little all the pieces. little puzzle pieces. Those those rules of Bible study. Study. Bible study. On your puzzle pieces. Your puzzle pieces. Figuring out how figuring out, out how things together. are put together. God's good, man. God's good, man. He's all about revealing. He's all about to revealing us. to us his plan, his plans, purpose. his purpose. His no, his no. Loves us, loves us. And what's really mind blowing? I'll say it again. I'll say it again. Every Sunday, Sunday, as long as I live, as long as I live, he's giving you the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to guide you, to guide you, to reveal to you. How blessed are you? How blessed are you? How blessed are we? How blessed are we? Hey, Nick, don't leave. Hey, Nick, don't leave. I need to talk to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time tonight. Thank you for our time tonight. For your word, for your words, beauty, its depth, its depth. For this, for this Zachariah, Zachariah, just be with us. Be with us, Lord, as we go home tonight. Go home tonight. I allow your spirit to remind us. Remind us how privileged and how great and how great of a of a of a people we are because of who we are and who we are and what you did for each and every one of us. Lord, I. Lord, I can't say enough can't about, say enough about um, uh, what you mean to me what personally, you mean to me and how, personally and how, Lord, uh, Lord, uh, you've allowed me, you've allowed me to be a being of our purpose, and purpose. We just love you, Lord. We just thank you, and we praise you, and we give you all the glory, give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.